Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 418. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. This week's interview is with Lee Mears. Lee's a hooker of repute. He played 16 years as a professional rugby player, appearing in 263 matches for the Bath Rugby Club, earning 42 international caps representing England, and playing for the prestigious British and Irish Lions. Today, Lee is an executive coach at the Preston Associates and co-founder of Teacup, a technology that helps companies to measure and address well-being issues. In this conversation with Lee, we discuss the way rugby has been evolving. How does one define leadership in rugby? And how it differs when you move from the club to national to the Lions team. We look at the importance of well-being, Lee's life lessons, useful and transferable elements for business executives, as well as the Teacup Initiative. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. Please do consider to drop in your rating and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Lee Mears, what a pleasure to have you on the show. I am a huge Rugger fan, as most of my listeners will know for all these years of talking about it. You are a, a seasoned rugby veteran, having played for Bath, fantastic team, England, and the British and Irish Lions, of all things. Lee, in your own words, how would you like to describe yourself? Oh, crikey. Well, uh, as we know with rugby, it's more about self-deprecation, isn't it? And a lot of people would say uh, I'm a short, fat bloke that was uh, good at dodging and staying out of contact. So uh, that's how I'd probably <laughs> describe myself. But you managed always, to keep your ears. Yeah, luckily most keep my ears and uh, always tried to play with a smile on my face. That's how I'd like to be remembered. And what do you do uh, for fun these days, Lee? Oh, crikey. Um, lots of stuff, really. I discovered skiing. Um, I skied. Um, you weren't allowed to ski playing rugby. Um, so it was one of the things that I thought, oh, I've got to give it a go. Um, and the minute I finished, um, I got into skiing and I've fallen in love uh, with skiing. I've tried to even drag my wife to the mountains and go and live in France for a bit. Uh, oh. but, she, <laughs> but she won't have any of it. So, uh, so yeah, I love skiing um, and still keeping fit um and just sort of socializing really you are so you retired um several years ago uh, due to a health situation tell us about a little bit more about your rugby career and and the moment you had to give it up yes well i think um i mean rugby wise it was it was super swimming yeah i mean I had to start off um, as always. And one of my life lessons is nothing comes without a bit of hard work. And for anyone that had followed my career, being a youngster um, coming into Bath at the time, internationals in every position, um, steeped in history. And my housemates at the time were Ian Bolshaw, who went on to play for the British Irish Lions and a World Cup winner, Mike Tyndall, um, a World Cup winner, probably more famous for, for now being in the Royal Family. Um, but they were my housemates and within about a year, two years, they were accelerated. They were in the first team and, uh, you know, and I'm there going, well, when's my chance? When's my chance? But as a forward, it takes so, so much longer. And so I probably didn't start playing till about four years after. Um, um, but I did realize as a wise prop once told me, um, your career probably Lee, because you do get beaten up a fair bit lasts around 10 years. And you can either earn really good money the first five um, and then obviously your speed fails you or you can earn reasonable money when you finally get there and start earning some money. You're about 26 and you can keep going till about 36. So you get a longer career. And I thought, oh, OK, I hadn't ever thought about it like that. So I was very lucky to have 16 years of sort of top flight rugby uh, and surrounded by some amazing people. And we can dig into that later. But it was coming towards the end of my career. And I, like I said, I'd had a pretty good run of it. I'd retired from international rugby. And uh, I was sort of looking at the next two or three years, you know, what shall I do next? And um, I was doing my pilot's license because I thought, oh, I would love to, to be a pilot. I wanted to be a pilot as a youngster, been in the air cadets. Um, so I thought, what about sort of being a pilot? So I was doing my pilot's license 
And uh, I remember to this day, I had to go down to a lovely lady doctor in street uh, about half an hour from, from Bath. And she hooked me up to sort of some leads and said, oh, um, you know, you've had your eyes done yet, 2020 vision, and your blood pressure, oh, very good, you're very healthy. I was like, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. And then she said, um, oh, I can't give you, uh, I can't sign your medical. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, no, I'm really sorry. You've got an unusual heart rhythm. Is, have you had this before? And I sort of, and yeah, I'm in a back bedroom, small little box room. And I said, Look, I'm not being funny. I get tested every year. We'll get really good health care. I'm sure it must be your machine. And she said, well, it might be. She's so lovely. She said, it might be, but I can't sign the form. And all I wanted to do is just fly in a circle. You just need that bit of paper uh, to do your solo. So I then went back to our club doctor and had to come a bit clean because they, you know, they, they don't like you doing too many dangerous things. They wrap you in cotton wool. And I said, look, doc, you know, I, I want to fly in a circle. The lady wouldn't sign me off. Apparently I've got an unusual rhythm. He said, no, Lee, you've, you know, you've tested all the time. He said, look, cry cardiac risk in the young, who I'm now a bit of a patron for, uh, coming in in two weeks. If you hold out, they bring their scanners. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yep, no problem. So I continued doing doing a bit more flying on my day off. And, accompanied. Uh, yes, accompanied, yep. And then two weeks later, Cry came in and I did the same thing, laid on my side, had the leads on. The nurse sort of said, um, uh, oh, I need to refer you to the doctor. Doctor comes over. Oh, we're just going to just do you an echo. And then they're like, mm, something's not right. And of course, I was like, oh, here we go. And uh, they said, look, you're going to have to go and see. And the main man uh, at Cry is a guy called Professor Sanjay Sharma, um, an amazing guy. And they said, you're going to have to go up to London to see him. And at the time, you're trying to cram hours in. You're trying to take tests for, for flying. And I didn't have a day to go to London. So I said, look, can we do Bristol? Yeah, yeah, we'll send you to Bristol. So I went for an MRI in Bristol. And the lady came through, didn't know I was an athlete or anything. She's like, oh, I think you've got heart disease. And literally everything went crazy. The doctors were in, you know, you're supposed to play on Saturday. What's going on? And then, of course, as always, you got to go to London to see Sanjay Sharma. <laughs> so, uh, I, so I went up to see Prof Sharma and I basically had a thickening of the wall of my heart, which um, causes your heart to under, under rev. So if me and Newman's are stood at 50 beats a minute, mine thinks it's at 40 which is not a problem, live a normal life. Go up to 100 beats, mine thinks it's at 80. Again, exercise, not a problem. It's when you push to 200, which, you know, elite sport, supposedly I did. I said I always stood on the wing and just uh, and stayed out of the way. But when you push to that level, yours is going, stop. And mine's going, oh, 160, let's keep going. And that's what could give me a heart attack. So, um we had a lot of discussions. I just had my second child um, at the time. And it was really weird because when you're in that sport mentality um, and that elite performance, bit, it's just, yeah, let's carry on. You've got this far. Just another then, little problem. Exactly. Yeah. Overcome it. It's not affected you so far. And then I was very lucky to, to meet a guy who's been a real influence in my life called David Scotland um, as an exec coach. And one of the reasons why I got into the work I do today. And he sort of said, you know, who would be affected? What else have you got to achieve? What would it be like for your family if you did have a heart attack on the field? And you watch pictures of, you know, videos of Fabrice Mwumbo and all the, 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 the knock on. And then all of a sudden you're pulled out of that selfish athlete mindset and go, oh, there's another life out here and there's more people relying on you. And so within two weeks, that was me done. Uh, the game on Saturday, did you play? Uh, yes, I played in that game. And then uh, and then after that, that was the last time. And one of those things that that game sort of cemented it for me as well is that you, in the back of your mind, even training, all of a sudden now there's a voice going, what was that? Oh, what was that? And when you're playing, you haven't got time. You haven't got the energy to worry about stuff. You're bulletproof. And the minute those doubts come into your head, oh, what was that? Oh, is that? Yeah, I think you're done anyway, I think. So, um, yeah, David was definitely super helpful in helping me get over it and realise it was the end. Um, and I, you'll see that I've told myself lots of stories to get through it. Um, but, yeah, that's that was it. And did you know at the end of the game that was it? Yes, yeah, I think so. I, I think before that game, to be honest, I knew 
um, I knew that was, it was, you know, it was all sort of kicking off. Tell me about the uh, final whistle of that game. She's, I think it was, because it hadn't been confirmed and I hadn't seen Sanjay yet, I think it was, you know, hope really that this isn't going to be it, this isn't going to be it. But deep down, you just knew that this could be the last time you ever, ever step foot on the field. And how it, was your how was your well being at that point? What were you what was going through your emotions? Really interesting. Now, because people have asked me this since when you're an athlete and they say, Oh, well being, you know, did you did you work on your well being when you're when you were an you know, when you were a rugby player? And I was like, well being, I've got no idea what you're on about. And it probably wasn't until four or five years ago, maybe four, when I went down to my wife and being a lifelong learner, I love learning. So it's constantly like, what's new, what's new? And I'd gone on a course about homeostasis and how to how your mood can really affect how you feel and, and wellness. And I went downstairs to, to Danielle, my wife, and said, oh, you know, she said, how's the course? I said, yeah, it's quite, quite good, but I don't really understand it. I don't, I don't know. I don't get it. And she said, what do you mean you don't get? And I said, well, I don't understand wellness. And she said, of course you don't understand wellness, you idiot. You're the most selfish man in the world. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you've lived your life knowing that if your body's not right, if your sleep pattern's not right, if your food's not right, if your mood's not right, you can't perform. She said, so it's not a fact of you don't know, you've just lived wellness your whole life. And I went, oh and then of course I went back to the course and was chatting with other people and I had no idea that people work and then try and fit the other things around that keep them healthy when you're an athlete you do all the the right things first then you perform and and since then that's led some of the most sort of amazing conversations within my coaching clients around you know I I did say to one of my uh, execs we talked about his three biggest arguments, biggest sort of, you know, worst things. And he said, it's always fly to America on the red eye, have a couple of glasses of wine, wake up tired, grumpy, go in a meeting, upset a few people and a deal falls apart. And I said to him, would you come and watch me play in Australia? Having known I'd been on the smash, I hadn't slept and then pay £150 for a ticket to watch a rugby match. He's like, no, of course I'm oh my god and I was like yes it's a performance you're and so that's sort of how I got into it so I think wellness for me was so you know because I was a small man in a big man sport as well I had to make sure that everything was right so I didn't drink for quite a few years um you know what? yeah yes yeah especially early on in my career um, you're doing what you used not to shoot the boot I mean that's really that's really yeah. low <laughs> I know I know but I did re- so there's a bit of context behind this. Firstly, it's probably the worst thing in the world to be allergic to beer. And, and I was allergic to beer. And uh, I just thought- I, I didn't young- know there was such a thing. <laughs> yeah. As a youngster, I, uh, I, I sort of, um, yeah, you have a few uh, drinks and you're experimenting with all of the different alco pops as you do. And then I'd drink a beer and I'd be like, whoa, my God, being sick straight away within about 15 minutes. And uh, I thought I was just uh, the term as you were, when you were young was, oh, lightweight, oh, Lee's a lightweight. And then, of course, you get into rugby circles. And uh, luckily in Devon, people would, you know, you'd drink a bit of cider. And I'd be like, oh, fine, fine. Drink a beer, be sick. And, uh, and so I remember being a 17-year-old uh, at Bath and we'd gone on our first away trip um, to France and in Dax. And uh, my older statesman, uh, props and, and hookers they call it molding I call it bullying uh, but they were like right busy drink so I was like I'll drink anything you want that's my initiation because I played quite well but I can't drink beer so of course what do they do drink beer so I said yeah okay I'll show you I'll drink a pint I'll be sick and then you'll leave me alone so I did it was literally instantly sick and they're like that's amazing do it again <laughs> So about six pints later, they were still having fun watching me projectile vomit. But after that, they then left me alone. So I, I spent a while drinking uh, drinking cider. But I just for a, you know for about four years, I just didn't touch a drop. My goodness, what a molding! 
Yeah. Um, so <laughs> as someone who's brought up in the professional era of rugby, I, I, I started, I'm older, far older, actually, almost like a career older um, in the amateur era. Of course, I was nothing at your level, but I was wondering what your perspective is and, and maybe just describe for those who don't know uh, the difference between professional and amateur rugby. What is your vision of that old fashioned amateur pre-professional rugby? Yeah. Oh, well, I've got quite a good story for you on this one, if you if you want it. But uh, I was lucky to bridge the gap between the two. So I got the tail end of so it was professional. It was in its second year when I joined Bath. But we got the tail end of all of the amateur um, guys. Who converted. That had, yeah, who'd converted. Uh, and some hadn't. They'd said, no, there's no point. You know, I want to carry on working. So we still had a couple of evening sessions on a, on a Thursday night to look after the the, the boys that were still up in London that had sort of career jobs. And then we were the youngsters just sort of milling around because there was nothing else for them. They hadn't worked out yet. What do we do with this lot when we've got them all day? We used to just have them in the evening. So people sort of say, what was more professional? But I do remember my uh, one of my first evenings on a Thursday um, in the sort of you know early professional era, um, everyone sort of getting warmed up. And all of a sudden, Lambridge... Um, which is our training ground. It's right on the London Road in Bath. It's rickety old sheds. It's quite run down. And uh, all of a sudden, this limousine pulls into the car park. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking just part of amateur. And out of the limousine gets Victor Obogu, Adedeo Adebo, Steve Ajomo, Simon Gagan, all the city boys. And uh, of course, it was cheaper for them to get a limo from London than it was for them to catch the train. <laughs> So, uh, so my baptism of amateur uh, amateurism was pretty uh, pretty high uh, early on, and I did I do think they actually sent him to go and get takeaway for them on the way home. Nice, um, <laughs> but no, in reality, where it sort of went from there is all of a sudden you were you were paid to be there every day on time, and it, it has its pros, unbelievable pros. I mean, you look at the athletes now that the boys are. Um, it's absolutely crazy. But the con side of it is that you weren't exposed to, um, and the bit that I think the guys miss now is that whole, um, the growing up, you know, I was given a house with three other numpties. It was a bit like university. We had money to, you know, to, to play with, not huge amounts for yet to budget, but you, you were, you know, you were constantly learning stuff and doing stuff outside of rugby. Victor Bogu would say, right, you're coming to London. We've got a dinner. And you go up to London and you'd sit on the table and you'd find that you were with the chief exec from O2. And you're going, oh, my God, you know, what is it you do? And I got really interested in people, whereas now the amateur era, slowly but surely, and we mentioned wellness earlier, they start realising that actually being on a bus on a Wednesday night to London is probably not good for your, um, your, your recovery um, if you've been beaten up all afternoon. And so a lot of that stuff started to, to change. And... I was exposed to people who had, you know, they were surgeons, they were doctors, they were lawyers at part time. And you, you then go, oh, actually, there's life after rugby. So what should I do? What career interests me? Whereas I think now, unfortunately, for some of the youngsters, it's purely rugby, 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 rugby. Then when they get their head up, it's a bit of a shock um, because you haven't. It's a, it was an extension of school. I do joke and sort of say I was very lucky till 32. I was told what to eat, where to be what to wear, what time. <laughs> it was great. Well, and you integrated well-being. So that, that clearly is a, a positive. So you are now a coach on leadership. And um, so I, I, I played 18 years of rugby myself, obviously at just a, a peewee level. Um, how do you describe leadership on a rugby pitch? I mean, is it just the captain? How, how, what's your spiel on, on leadership on a rugby pitch? Yeah, again, that's a, a lovely question. And um, and I think rugby is quite unusual. Um, and I think because you've got the gladiatorial um, sort of element to it, I think you've also got, it's quite complicated. So the, you know, I'd say as a front row, I'd like to say as a front row, it's you've got to be quite clever to play it. But it is it gets quite complicated. Um, and it's so diverse. Um, I always used to take the mick and say, look, we didn't like the wingers because all they cared about is their hair and their six pack. And they didn't really like me because I was short, fat and slow. And when I got tired, I made mistakes and knocked the ball on. 
but without the different people in there you can't function um you know even the second rows you know six foot eight of them they smell different oxygen and they're into different things but with that you've got to come together and the best teams i played in really had that the common goal you always want to win but if you start to have pockets of self-interest if you do have that that camaraderie becomes negative then it can be really divisive um and so going into the business world i didn't realize how how sports and how we'd leveraged people's attitude to really extract discretionary effort um because up to a certain amount, yes, pay works, yes, sort of your where your your environment is, but actually it's the, the the bond between people and the common goal and the journey, the bit, and you'll hear me say a lot, but I was all about making memories. And the teams that I played in, yes, we won matches and yes, we won finals, but the memories we made, that's the bit I look back at now and I miss the Thursday afternoons going to Pizza Hut or when Robbie Fleck got an eagle on the golf course, it's the the stuff, the camaraderie. And so I've taken a lot of my learnings um, that I've had, how to get the best out of others around you into, into business. And I think the businesses that I've seen operate the best are the ones that get the discretionary effort out of our people, you know, people that are there, not just because they want to, to, to earn a paycheck, but people that love what they're doing. I love this idea. I've, I've been talking about discretionary energy for quite a while and, and it, you know, cause everybody is doing average. They have good intentions and want to do well, but what is it that just makes you leap out of bed and, and just push through the pain, get to that next level. I was just reading a letter that apparently Steve Jobs wrote just before he died. And he said, yes, I can, you know, I can afford the, the most expensive watches, but a, a $30 watch, also tells the time the only thing that really matters actually are friends and family so there is there is this element so the thing about sports essentially is that just like in business you really only plan for winning that is the plan how are we going to win how do you qualify or create a purpose beyond winning what what are the types of avenues you can go because if, you know the other team also is planning to win that is the nature of the game it's you or me of course you can actually tie in rugby but generally speaking it's you or me how do you create a purpose that that supersedes that supplants that that notion of just winning because that's just the paycheck in some regards yeah and and, and that was something to it you know that it dawned on me towards the, not towards the end, but around the middle of my career, because you do, you start to win and it, you know, your body's hurting. You wake up the next day and you go, oh, we won and we're competitive and that's all we care about. But actually you go, oh, well, because some wins are hollow. You know, some wins you go, well, we were going to win that one anyway. We're better than them. And, and other wins you go, yes, we, we beat them and there's no way in the world that we should have beaten them. So I think eventually we started to get out of, or I did and, the, and a few of the, the senior players, that the, the result will take care of itself. It's the process. Concentrate on the process of getting better, improving. Are you further forward than you were last week? And the results will take care of itself because there's some stuff you can't control. Are they a better team? Do they have more money than you? Do you have a few injuries to key areas? So if you constantly judge yourself on a result, it becomes very much up and down and up and down. And one thing you can't really do in sport is be on that emotional roller coaster because that will sap your energy more than anything else. So for us, the purpose was, are we growing as a group? Are we getting the best out of this group? Is this group a, we need to win, you know, are we definitely going to win the championship with this? Or is it going to take a humongous effort because there's some better teams out there? And this is the bit that I do like is that people think rugby players are all, you know, sort of, you know, muscle bound, but actually you need quite a bit of humility and we're quite sensitive. You know, you need to know that you've got a 19 year old who is missing home and he has, you know, and he's missing his mum and his, and his family or, You've got someone else who's going through a divorce. You, you need to bear and open up so that that person knows what's going on in your world because then you're going to go even further for them. And that's the bit for me that made 
the powerful teams, not just that, right, we're going to win on a Saturday. Who are you doing it for? Why are you doing this? You know, why am I in the trenches with you? And why am I putting my body on the line? And when you open up and you see that, you know, the deeper side of someone, then it's easy to push. Then you're getting into the sort of military. Um, brothers you know, the, in arms. Yeah, brothers in arms stuff. And then that becomes more powerful because you're not doing it for a result. You're doing it for other people. You're doing it for other people's families. Um, and the result will take care of itself as long as you, you, know, you do your role, you do your job and love doing it. It's a fascinating, I would say, sort of paradox in some regard, whether it's the military or the rugby. Being a wuss isn't exactly what is prescribed. And, uh, you know, you, you have a sixth beard or you're going to projectile vomit on it. This is sort of an image that one has. And for having been in a few locker rooms, there's lots of bawdry, body talks and, and, and uh, you know, stiff upper lip. You're not going to complain about your broken finger. But complaining about or exposing my vulnerabilities or my issues, like the divorce, uh, um, or I, feel I miss home, you would imagine that'd be a hard thing to bring up in that kind of an environment where, hey, just drink and shut up, or you know, just get on with it, yeah, you know, wrap it up, put on a wet sponge, and 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 your knee will get better miraculously. How how do you describe that? I mean, if certainly in my in my era, I, I have I I, I f certainly believe, and and this is just a feeling, that I generally speaking have this positive bias. If you're a rugger player, I'm in going to likely trust you, or I certainly have a proclivity to want to trust you. Can you talk us through how that comes around, and how do you allow for create? vulnerability when it's all about stiff upper lip and you know hard hitting yeah uh, it's it's a uh, yeah i love your question and it is a uh, it's trust is is huge i think there's also a bit of psychological safety as well making people feel safe in their environment and that's where the the tribalism comes off especially in bath it's your family um we changed it a little bit towards the end because you get your family your family let you get away with murder and actually um sport is about performance so as long as you're putting in the effort, your family looks after you. And so I think a lot of people were judged on effort and you can do whatever you want and say whatever you want as long as. And the beauty of sport is you can't hide. You can see when someone's digging in. And that's that bit you spoke about. You know, are you running away from contact? Are you getting are you giving everything you've got? And that happens in training. Um, we did quite a few uh, military camps. Um, and that's why I sort of said, um, and I'll, I'll come back to the answer in a second, but we went to quite a few military camps and they always sort of said to us, we're so similar. And we were like, no, we're not. If you make a mistake, you die. <laughs> if we make a mistake, we just get abused by a few million people in the papers. Um, but there was something about that, that camaraderie. And I think stripping away, which is what rugby does and the military does, stripping away all of the... Um, the fake stuff to begin with and you have to bear all you shower together you eat together you, there's no hiding and I think once you're in that safe space you feel like you're okay to open up um, and once you realize that actually telling somebody honestly what's going on in your world is really powerful rather than being guarded because people see you as cold they see you as hiding stuff we've got this amazing sense I believe um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but we call, I call it the bullshit sensor. But you see someone opposite you and you're like, they're not telling me something. Therefore, am I going to go to the nth degree? And this is the political bit sometimes I see in businesses. I've got an agenda and nobody knows about it. Everybody knows you're, they don't know what your agenda is, but they can pick it up. They sense it and therefore the trust disappears. And, and, and that was the beauty for me in sport is that you... You, you see what you commit to, what you say you're going to do on a Monday morning on the video. Did you do it? And if you didn't, you've got to be damn sure that you're apologizing and telling everybody why. Um, otherwise, your trust goes very quickly. But, yeah, I think sports are very hot. Trust is, is key. That's beautiful. I'm just thinking also then, being a professional rugby player at your level, Lee, you're also a public figure wikipedia page the news you have a couple of million people who are going to rat on you for dropping that ball 
or or not you know or taking a penalty or whatever so you have that vulnerability within the team if you tell your you know your prop hey listen i'm i'm going through a bad patch the you're obviously going to at least trust the prop not to share that with the journalist. At the same time, how much of that does that needs or can play out in the public's eye? Is there an element of trust? Because the relationship between the team now and your public, your your fans, how does that mold in? Because there, there's that fandom is is radically important. That that hurrah as you come onto the pitch the score, the, the elation. Talk us through how, how does that trust come around? Yeah, oh, that's a real difficult one at the moment. And I think we're seeing some elements of the of sport having to evolve because initially I think people were seeing the outside world and sometimes the papers do this to you. They want to vilify you. They want to make you uh, yeah, they do want to stitch you up at times because it sells newspapers. And hopefully, I think there is a cultural shift at the moment. I don't know if you've watched um, uh, Drive to Survive, the Formula One. Um, it's brilliant. You've got to have a look. And it's they're starting to do a lot of documentaries now around sports teams and letting you see the athletes inside. So I'm, And so I'm sort of saying, let's stay away from Twitter. Let's stay away from instagram and the fake sort of cyber friends but actually really let the cameras see what's going in i think the reason the ufc has been so popular is that um, dana white allowed cameras into they set up a thing called um uh the ultimate fighter and you got to see the real personality the real people the same with the formula one drivers all of a sudden my wife hates formula one but she will watch this documentary because you're seeing the real people and I think for a while we were so media trained, you would have footballers, rugby players, cricketers get in front of the camera and it was you know, the usual line. How did you play today? We need to work on a few things, you know, and, and what's going on? We, and, and we get there's nothing being given. And of course, people were, you know, they do fall out with the sport or they want to know the sort of the, the, the naughtier stuff. I think we just want to know that people are human. And I think hopefully it, in all sports, especially with these documentaries behind the um, behind the lines, if you can actually see what somebody's like, really, you can you can really um, relate to them. Because at the end of the day, we're all human. <laughs> yeah, we do like bashing each other, and we're a bit strange in different parts. As long as you accept that, but everybody has their strengths and weaknesses, and that's the bit that I think we need to show more as athletes. Is you are not bulletproof. Um, you know, you've got some really good traits and you've got some really weird, bad traits. And it's how your team cover those. Yeah. So if you take those, uh, that assemblage of, of comments and thoughts with regard to Rugga, how do they apply in business? Uh, to what extent is there a correlation? Yeah. Because I, I, f- I feel that in my mind, there is a direct link between what you're saying. But how, how does it, what's the what does Lee think about that? Yeah, well, first and foremost, that diversity piece is key. When you're building a team in business, you do not need 15 Lee Mearses, even though, well, I know, and that's the that's the bit I think in sport is, yes, I like people like me, and I love having a coffee and a moan with those fellow front rowers. And I look over and I'm probably jealous and envious of the, of the wingers, and they talk a language that I've got no interest in. But you've got to you need to relate to them. And I think it goes back to my schoolboy days. Um, We didn't have enough players for a team. So we used to bully the footballers because they were fast. And uh, yes. And say, please come and play for us and you'll score tries and you'll look good. And they're like, no way. We'll get bashed on the nose. And we're like, no, no, we'll do that bit. You just do the scoring. And then they at first were saying no way. But then in the football season, they needed some numpties to sand in defence and kick people. So we're like, well, we'll do that if you come and play for us. And then in the summer, we had nothing else to do. So we all played cricket. <laughs> and, and, and that sort of is how one of my life lessons is get the best out of the others around you. And that's where I think in business, sometimes there is this tendency to go, it's all about academia, you know, and we don't, uh, we're in finance and we don't want any creatives because that slows us down. And then you go to, to marketing uh, and, and they're all going, oh God, don't get us near the, the finance guys because 
they, you know, they just slow us down and they look at risk and we're creative. And I think there's a real way of getting everybody together. And I'm seeing it a lot more in startups because it's smaller groups that people start to embrace that diversity. Um, you know, and we're not even talking male, male or female. We're just talking across the board. What are your skill sets and who do you need near you to complement you? And a lot of times, sometimes it's our opposites, you know, people that will argue with you till the, you know, the, the cows come home. As long as you've got a, a how do we win, we win rather than you or I win, then I think you're, uh, you're onto a winner. So they're the sort of parallels that I, I talk about. It seems like a really good framework for what we call the DIE, D-I-E type of diversity, because if you have that first of all, notion of diversity being just different mindsets, different talents, different skills, different backgrounds, then it becomes easier to integrate, let's say, what we call more visible diversity or even invisible, but the other forms of diversity that we talk about a lot. What I have one more real rugby question, which is, so when we talked about pros, one of the things that's challenging in most professional sports is the fact that you can get bought and you go from Bath to Saracens or, you know, God forbid. So you don't have the same kind of fidelity that we used to have in the amateur days to a team. I mean, you, 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 I just don't, I don't recall any of that sort of things happening in business. Of course, you, you, you do admission and you get hired by another company. And, and so it does really smack of professional rugby, if you will. What I wanted to get to you with was the fact that you go from Bath, where you have a family, where you have to perform, and then you get selected for the Lions. Yeah. And this is, you, you're no longer even able to say, I'm, I'm a Bath player or an England player, I'm a Lions player. How does leadership in that space, whether it's England national team or the Lions, change from leadership? in a bath team where you are in and out together as a team? Yeah, uh, uh, this is a really interesting one because um, again, in that sort of mindset of, I just want to be better, I want to be better. You, you, you're playing for bath and like you say, it's your family and you really know the little nuances of different people and, and people coming and going and all of that kind of stuff. But, but in the back of your mind, you've grown up, I want to be the best, I want to play for England. And so, yeah, on my radar, I was like, I play for England, I want to play for England. And to do that, you need a successful Bath team. So grow your Bath team, move up to the next level and play for England. And then every four years, this thing comes around that you it's on your radar, but not really. And it's, you know, the British and Irish Lions. And of course, being competitive, what does that mean? Well, it means I'm not just one of the best in Bath. It's not just one of the best in England. This gives me the opportunity to be one of the best in the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, this is amazing. So then you're on, you're driving, right? Here we go. Got to play well in the Six Nations. You've got to do really well. And so you're driving, you're driving, you're driving. You get picked and you get all the adulation, everybody ringing you saying, well done, well done, amazing. And you're going, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, brilliant. This is going to be awesome. You turn up to Penny Hill Park, which is where we met for the first time as, as, as Lions players. And you realise, holy shit, I am surrounded by my arch enemies. Because with club rugby, like you said, it's quite family because you spend so much time together. With England, you've got little cliques. Like we used to take the mick out the Leicester boys because they have coffee together and it's hard to break them up. But you're playing for your country, so it, that it sort of gets surpassed. But the Lions is a one in four years. It is people that you, you sit, apart from the Irish, you, where you do share tables at the end of the game. Nowadays, you play, you finish. You have a presentation of corner flags, you disappear. And then the next year you come back and you play them again. And then they're at your house and you try and beat them up. So there's no friendship there. And, and they are your enemies. And then you've got a coach saying, look, we need to know how you all play, um, how you all act, because we want to build a, a, a game plan that you know, we think is going to work. And you start going, whoa, whoa, whoa all of my England ideas you're asking me to put into the pot with all of my enemies so they can take everything out. 
you're having, you are literally having a laugh and you can see, you know, I can't wait to get you on the training field. Cause then you also know on the training pitch, there's no referees. So you've got a few little debts to settle <laughs> uh, and you, and you want to, you know, you want to earn their respect as well. And that's where it starts. How do I re- earn the respect of these boys so that they'll play for me? And the, the way it worked for us was Paul O'Connell just, the best leader I've ever worked with stood up and opened again. This is the humility piece and and the the bearing your soul basically said, look guys, I was involved in this tour four years ago and it was rubbish. He said, I didn't enjoy it mainly because we didn't share rooms. We didn't get to know each other. We were super professional, but it just didn't work. And I've now got a second chance and I want to remember this, you know, because some of us will never get this opportunity again. He said, I want to remember this as one of the best trips I've ever been on. We're already the best players um, in the in the Northern Hemisphere. But I, you know, he said, I, I, I beg, I implore you to sacrifice 20 percent of your professionalism. That is the videos, the eating, the sleeping, the normally that you do to be that total athlete. Sacrifice 20 percent of that and become friends, become mates. Um, And he said, if I haven't had a beer with you, if I don't know what your partner's called, what the name of your kid's called, I've not done my job as a captain. So knock on my door at any time. You can see if you're the Welsh boy smiling. Knock on my door at any time of the night. If I haven't had a beer with you, I've not done my job. And to be fair to him, he got around everybody. And that was the way the tour went. Become friends first, earn each other's respect. And then on the field, you'll play for each other harder. And It was such a good tour because it was about making memories. It was about connecting. You know, we shared rooms every time we moved hotel, we shared with someone different. Um, And and that for me, that leadership bit came from wanting to earn everybody's respect, but also wanting to get to know what are the levers you need to pull to get the best out of others. So listening to you, Lee, I had that tingling sensation go from the top of my scalp down through back through my neck into the back. That is the feeling that that inspired in me. It really, it's it's amazing to hear because you imagine these pros always showing up and there's the the image we have, but it's wonderful to hear about that example where he says, well, you know, you, I'm come and knock on my door and, and basically have a beer with me or cider um, for you, or maybe a cup of coffee. Um, and 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 be personal and it, it, it this this language of personal when it's all about performance and being professional is music to my ears and, and and yet i feel it's so foreign to so many business companies just like this whole idea of well-being you know how did you sleep you know oh yeah darling i slept well All right well that's my what well, might happen at happen at home but it's also relevant in the performance of your company. And so we could, should be talking about sleep at, at business, you know, napping or whatever it takes to, to in, the, in, the, in the destination of performance. What is that process that goes through? So last part of the conversation I really wanted to focus on was your uh, adventure at Teacup, a lovely British name for a company. So um, you founded Teacup um, a couple of years ago with a wonderful story that you told me before we started recording. Tell us more, uh, what is Teacup and uh, have a cup of tea? <laughs> well, uh, so Teacup was founded um, by me and a, and a friend of mine called Ed Van Ruin. And um, it segued nicely actually into that sort of story that I just told you there about the British and Irish Alliance because I spoke at a conference for him um, when he was growing his business and he was trying to amalgamate all the insurance people um, together and they weren't one, they, they weren't coming together. There was no point. Why would you, you know, it, it's just as, you know, again, why would I share all my data? And part of that story that um, with that lion's thing is that actually when you think that you're giving away stuff, you're actually getting more than you realize. And everybody knows now after a six nations year, if people have shared their, all of their IP, you don't get worse, you get better because you learn from everybody else. And so Ed uh, you know, ended up 
selling his company as a result, he says, as a result of my speech. I wouldn't put it down to that. He's a pretty amazing CEO. But he said it did break down a barrier. And when he finished, um, when he finished that, he got into a bit of a spiral. And he says, he, you know, a life changing event, you sell your business. You think everything's going to be amazing. You think that you can play golf every day. You think, but you, if you are a passionate businessman and you lose your passion, you, you've got to find a way to get it back. And so I ended up doing a bit of coaching with him um, and chatting about, you know, what do you want out of life and what does a successful life look like? And a bit like the coaching that I'd had from David Scotland around what's next I then started to ask Ed some of those questions. Um, what does he want to be known for? What does he want out of his family? You know, what, what really? We, a lot of times we, we focus on what do we want, but actually we lose the bit of who are we and who, what, you know, when are we happiest? And Ed was just blown away by this. And he said, I think we could create an app. Um, and we ended up um, creating Teacup, which is, essentially it's a wellness tracker how are you tracking how are you trending and how you know are you able to look back and because a lot of times we don't know when we're at our best either um because we sort of we're constantly on to the next day on to the next day on to the next day and very rarely do you pause and go what you know when was I at my best when was I you know what is it that really makes me happiest you know so for some people it's sleep for some people, it's diet. For some people, I mean, for me personally, if I don't exercise, oh my goodness, you're never going to get anything out of me. So, but we're all different. So we came up with this idea that if you could track the, the key elements of your wellness, you then know, at least you know where to start. And that's how Teacup was born. Um, and it was almost around, um, you know, how full is your cup? Um, you know what element what bits are you focusing on at the moment even if you focus on one element of your wellness you you can see your cup moving forward and and that's what we wanted to do we wanted to help people fill their cups it's a remarkable thought that i, I would I, my, in my entire career i never had an opportunity to say oh i did a marketing campaign and it's because i didn't drink coffee that morning or I slept seven and a half hours with only one time going to pee. You know, how, we don't ever have access to that type of causal relationship. It's, it's the only, it's the narratives we have. And, and, and it's probably related to how intelligent I am that that marketing campaign came around. That's what we're sort of trained to do. Well, I, I went to business school. I did that campaign because I thought about my four P's and, I did it right with my team. I led them the right way. The idea that I had an emotional baggage or not, or some kind of other well-being concept with my team's ability then, therefore, to create that marketing campaign, that, that, that must be quite a radical thought for some of your clients. Or is it the clients come to you and they're kind of predisposed to it already? How, how do you get your clients into Teacup? Yeah, um, well, I think more and more um, the business world is on a, it's constantly push, 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 push. And this is where it is a little bit different from sport because in sport you go, right, we need, we're going to have a sprint. And, and again, I, I liken it to some of the tech firms I work with now. Let's sprint, get to a certain part in the season and let's chill, then sprint, then relax. Whereas business just sort of goes, put your foot down. And obviously with technology, you're now wired in, you know, you even look at this pandemic. Um, you know, oh, I've got two extra hours that I've got back from not having to commute. And then within three months, I am now working from eight till six instead of from nine till, and you're just going, oh my goodness. And, and so what we're sort of saying is, again, if we go back to that discretionary effort, people with the right holistic approach can actually be more can be more effective and if you can measure when you've slept eight hours and you and you've only got up once to pee and you're more productive you start to go whoa, whoa, whoa okay these are the things that i need to focus on if you are a five hour sleeper and i take your you know and we're getting really deep now and i take your cortisol and your cortisol levels through the roof 
Uh, and I go, brilliant, you can sleep for five hours for two more weeks and let's measure you at the end of that. <laughs> you know, and these are all things in rugby you do, you, you measure what has a massive impact. And I think businesses are now realizing that they're burning staff out. People are moving further away, faster. Um, how do you hold on to talent? You know, Goldman uh, in the in the past, you would just go to Goldman because of, you know, because of the the kudos now you know young graduates really clever people are going whoa, 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 whoa that life is not for me I am not going to be treated like that and I think problems before were complicated and it took intelligence I think now problems are complex and it's taking that bit that we spoke about before the diversity of thought all of those different people which is relationships it's no longer IQ it's really EQ of how do we, how do I get all these people to work and talk the same language and pull in the same direction? And if they're not happy, I don't think you can get that out of them. If they're not enjoying the environment, if they're not functioning themselves, um, then you'll lose them. And I think businesses are now going, well, actually, I think I need to treat my staff like an athlete and ask them, what do you need in order to perform? As opposed to just keep doing this, the cultural bit. We all work till 10 o'clock at night. You will work till 10 o'clock at night. All you'll get is a robot. I don't know if that Makes, sounds You know, it's fascinating because I'm thinking as I listen to you about my sister, who's a doctor running teams of doctors, life and death within hospitals, especially in this area where she's a cardiopulmonary critical care specialist. And, and you, well, you just got to do what you got to do because it's about the life and death of your clients. You're in a military. It's about the life and death of your, your chums, your comrades in arms. In Rugger, it's only 2 million people who are going to shame you. In business, it's the shareholder. There's this somehow constant drive. There's a reason why we have to continue to push, 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 push. And, and yet this idea of this soft information how did you sleep did you have sex last night um you know potentially <laughs> um hard to imagine in a business environment the question i'm having for you is as you've now done this for two years you've got a good number of clients what does it take for teacup to be successful how, how do you actually embed these types of information create that kind of vulnerability that's ultimately I mean, really what's happening when you're talking about your personal affairs and how you sleep and how you eat and, and everything else is going off the ball, to use another sports terminology. Yeah. How, how do you make teacup successful? What, what does it take? I think for us is the, the volume of data. Nobody up until this point has been able to track. Nobody's really measured the, this kind of stuff. And so our dream would be to have 5 million people understand what makes themselves thrive. And therefore, you can then tailor and target what's needed in the environment. So whether you are trying to change the culture around diet or you need to know at first what it is that you need to tweak. And I don't think as human beings, we reflect enough. Um, and so by reflecting on where you were, what you did, um, you know, and what you know, and what are the elements? Um, I think it's a really powerful tool. So if we can get five million people reflecting, then understanding what makes them thrive, and then the businesses supporting people to thrive, I think you're uh, you're onto a winner, and that would be our dream. It makes me think about you were talking about. You know, we save the two hours for the commute. Now we get to work from eight to six. And we're also talking in Asahela, I love my, 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 this idea of connecting dots here. We also talked about discretionary energy. Well, actually at some level, you have the opportunity to insert other information about your personal uh, pulse, heart rate, and all these other things. Um, and also about discretion in how you spend your time um, because it shouldn't be about more of your time you need to have that 20% that you were talking about somehow, or at least some element of your time that, that is also invested in bonding, creating trust with your colleagues, and, and not always just being about that performance and efficiencies. And you need to decouple somehow from the 
performance thing and 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 insert the discretionary desire because it has to be voluntary desire to get to know each other yeah and i think you've seen during this pandemic at first people were loving being at home because ultimately our family are really important and lo and behold everyone goes well i really like this being at home stuff i'm never going to go back to the office then Three months later, four months later, you've got lots of people going, I'm missing my friends and my colleagues. Because again, that whole bit around doing stuff with others is vitally important. I've got introverts now that are going, I cannot wait to go back to the office. Um, you know, I still want my time to think and process and do the mundane tasks, but I want to get out and meet people and see people. And I think that's that discretionary effort as human beings we are we are very social whether we are introverts extroverts we do like other human beings and you know even my kids say to me now because I've got three little boys they're like daddy we're bored of you now can you go because too much of one thing is enough so that's the bit that I think will unlock is at the end of the day we are tribal if you go right back in evolution we need to be around each other um and, and I'm just saying, I think you can live a richer life if you have helped people. And the question you always ask is, what do you want people to say about you that have worked with you when someone knocks on your door when you're 60? Was it that you gave them a bonus or was it that you helped them, you grew them and they loved working with you, for you? That for me is powerful. And that's the bit that I try and encourage leaders. What do you want people that have interacted with you say about you when you're 60, 70? I would say that is quite the perfect way to end our chat. Lee, what a lovely uh, and in, insightful uh, chat. I really appreciated it. Um, so how can someone track you down if you're not on Facebook or Instagram? My God. Yeah. Um, what are yeah. the best ways to to find out about you, Teacup, and, and your coaching business? Um, I think for me, uh, coaching-wise, I'm at lee.mears at the Preston Associates, uh, dot com, um, And then Teacup, anybody who is interested in what we were saying today about Teacup, um, you know, we'll give you a free checkup. We'd love to have, um, you know, again, because we do want to help. Um, so if you do want a free checkup for your business, uh, just getting uh, contact um with lee at teacup.co.uk um, and i'll add of course the um website in, into the show notes lee so listen i'm looking forward to hanging with you and having a cup of cider with you somewhere in the not too distant future thanks again for coming on the show super thanks for having me minto you're awesome Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. What's 
wrong with challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why Woman. 